Welcome back and welcome to the last video lecture of the semester. We're going to finish up by finishing our discussion of language and hemispheric um, asymmetry. So as we've done with most of the other chapters, we're going to discuss what happens when things go wrong with language and um, also with hemispheric um, issues and what that tells us, what we've learned from that. So what we know is that between 90 and 95 percent of us have speech in the left hemisphere and this is as determined by the WADA test. So what the WADA test is is a sedative is sent through the carotid artery that puts half the brain to sleep and with this then you can see which side of the brain is responsible for language based upon during that procedure whether or not the person can speak. So um, when there's damage to a side of the brain that has speech, aphasia can be the result. So aphasia is an impairment in language ability that's caused by a brain injury. You're likely familiar with uh, Wernicke's and Broca's aphasia, and we'll talk about these in the coming slides. But there are also other symptoms of aphasia um, that are notable. You have paraphasia, which is where an individual substitutes the wrong word for the intended word because it has something in common with the intended word, such as rhyming or sounding similar. When this happens, um, often in speech, you can imagine um, the context quickly gets very difficult to ascertain. There is also neologism, which is the creation of a completely new novel word. Um, and this can occur um, often with um, aphasias. So, also, almost all patients with aphasia show some impairment in reading, and this is called alexia. And they also may show um, apraxia, which is a motor movement disorder that affects one's ability to make complex sequential movements. And this is important because it affects our speech because um, speech, of course, requires very complex sequential movements in order to produce. So since speech and fine motor movements go hand in hand, these deficits can are very often related. So lesions to the left inferior frontal region, better known as Broca's area, cause what we call a non-fluent aphasia. That is because the aphasia causes difficulty in producing speech and individuals with this type of aphasia are able to speak only in a very labored, hesitant manner. Reading and writing is also impaired. However, these individual, individuals have an understanding of language that's still intact. So they know what you're saying um, and they want to talk to you, but they can't form the words. Um, Unfortunately, the book did not mention um, interventions, but one of the coolest interventions I've seen for Broca's aphasia involves singing. Uh, there's uh, melodic intonation therapy, which is a therapy where patients are taught how to sing in, um, instead of talk, because for many patients, singing is not impaired while speaking is. So thus, patients can learn to form words by singing their words instead of by speaking them normally. In Wernicke's aphasia, patients are able to produce plenty of verbal output, but many of the statements do not make sense, um, as the words don't go together properly. Some patients with fluent aphasia, um, which is Wernicke's is a fluent aphasia, um, also have anomia, which is difficulty in naming persons or objects. Since fluid aphasia seems to affect meaning, patients struggle with understanding what they read or hear. Um, so it's like they're unaware of what the words mean. Global aphasia is the total loss of ability to understand language or to produce language. It is the result of a large left hemisphere lesion that affects both the Wernicke and the Broca's areas. Given the amount of brain damage necessary to cause this, as you can see, um, this 
type of deficit is often accompanied by other impairments, and the prognosis is quite poor. The arcuate fasciculus is a bundle of axons that transmits information between Broca's and Wernicke's area, so it connects those two areas. When there's a lesion to these axons, the result is what we call a conduction aphasia. So with this, um, it leads to difficulty with repeating words or sentences. The rest of speech is intact, as is comprehension, but you just have that repetition. In most individuals, the left hemisphere is specialized for language, and the right hemisphere is mainly for spatial processing. Split-brain individuals are often used to study lateralization. For instance, split-brain individuals where you have the corpus callosum um, cut are able to name what they see in their right visual field because it's processed in the left hemisphere, but not um, what they see in their left visual field because the hemisphere is not communicating. The planum temporale uh, which is the upper surface of the temporal lobe, is very important for language. First, in individuals with dyslexia, the plane non temporale um, shows neuronal disorganization that may potentially cause dyslexia. It is also larger on the dominant side, usually the left, though research has not been able to show a direct link between the size of it and language dominance. Um, musical perception is per, um, impaired by damage there as well. Music activates the right hemisphere more than the left, though perfect pitch, um, where you're able to identify pitches, um, appears to be dominant on the left hemisphere. The planum temporale was twice as large in musicians with perfect pitch as it was in non-musical um, non people. As always, when there is brain damage um, and things go wrong, we of course can learn more about lateralization within the brain. So one interesting disorder is astrogenosis, which is um, an inability to recognize objects by touch and feel. This is usually due to damage to the interior end of the parietal region, including the postcentral gyrus, which is the primary cortical area for somatic sensation. So, in prosopagnosia, an individual is unable to recognize faces. This is due to damage to the fusiform gyrus, which is in the inferior surface of the cortex at the junction between the temporal and occipital lobe. Unfortunately, no amount of remedial training restores this ability. Damage to the right hemisphere seems to be particularly associated with prosopagnosia, though the worst cases involve damage to both hemispheres. Um, so we described the WADA test before. The WADA test has been used to detect differences in facial recognition by hemisphere. And when the left hemisphere is anesthetized, so when it's put to sleep, um, a participant is still able to detect um, that the image is blended with that of, their image is blended with that of a celebrity. But they're usually unable to do this and instead just see the celebrity when the right side is anesthetized. This is part of the reason we think the fusiform gyrus is especially important for the ability to recognize faces. Children are particularly able to recover from um, brain injuries. So, for instance, children with hemispherectomies, which are when one hemisphere, half the brain is removed, end up developing normally, and they can usually um, even have an average to above average IQ. So even if the left side is removed, actually the right side will take over language. So children have this amazing neuroplasticity. For adults, unfortunately, we don't see such awesome recovery, but some recovery can be attained. Um, the most, most of the recovery after a brain injury occurs in the first three months. And for some reason, 
Left-handed people usually show better recovery than those who are right-handed. Also, recovery from d brain damage is um, usually greater um, for it's usually greater than recovery from a stroke. So stroke recovery is not as good of a prognosis as if you have other brain damage. So CTE, CTE has been getting a lot of attention from the NFL especially. So what we know is that individuals who have um, recurrent head injuries can um, develop what we call chronic traumatic encephalitis encephalopathy or CTE. So what this is is CTE is a type of um, it involves the tau protein again with um, leading to neuronal cell death much like what you see with Alzheimer's disease. And the syndrome may be experienced as either a dementia or a cognitive impairment. People often um, have some mood changes, more depression, um, headaches are common with it. And in case you're wondering, this picture down here is of um, Derek Bordard, who died of a overdose and was later found to have CTE. Uh, with CTE, um, it appears that this is caused by multiple blows to the head, even if there wasn't a major brain injury or the in individual wasn't knocked unconscious. So it's not just for those who have had a traumatic brain injury, it's... Um, also touched by the cumulative effect of um, knocks to the head. So the nervous system also has tremendous opportunities for um, plasticity and recovery. And one way that's the most promising is with embryonic stem cells. So you'll remember from early on when we talked about stem cells, they travel to wherever they're going in the nervous system and then they become the type of cell they need to become. So with embryonic stem cells, once implanted, the hope is that they may differentiate into the type of neuron that's needed. And they've been used to treat Parkinson's disease, so of course there are some side effects we talked about, and stroke patients. Um, their use is still controversial, though it doesn't need to be. Um, often it's controversial because embryonic stem cells are often obtained through um, through fetuses, so actually um, fetuses that um, are killed and then the cells are harvested. And this is controversial. But you can actually get these stem cells from umbilical cords as well. So you can harvest these cells in a way that is not controversial. So just because you've heard this and, you know, maybe you don't like the one version of obtaining stem cells doesn't mean you have to be against the research or against their use. There's more than one way to obtain embryonic stem cells. You can also do a lot of good training um, with people who have had brain injury through using constraints and forcing them to use um, whatever the weaker arm or whatever it is that is weaker due to the injury. So constraint-induced movement therapy is where you reduce movement in the good limb and force the individual to use and exercise the weaker limb. So for instance, the good arm may be tied in a splint for 90% of the waking hours. Additionally, subjects will typically go to rehab for six hours a day, so it's pretty intensive. However, by doing so, Patients on average regain 75% of normal use of the paralyzed limb after only two weeks of therapy. So it's a very effective treatment for helping individuals who have had a stroke or other brain damage cope with and eventually overcome much of the impairment. And with that, I am very glad to say that is it. It is either summer or winter, depending on when you're taking this class, but... Um, that's all I got. So normally this is where I get all mushy on you in class, but it's different when you're recording videos. But I truly enjoy teaching this class. I love it. Um, I love working with you guys. I love teaching you this material. And so even though it may seem um, impersonal with it being through a video, I'm sure I'm going to do it in class too. 
just know that I appreciate you. I appreciate your hard work over the semester. Um, I hope you got something out of the class. And just know that I've enjoyed it. I always enjoy teaching this class. And it's fun because it's my natural laboratory. I did to try new teaching methods and try to find ways to help you learn better. And it's a lot of fun for me. So I appreciate your patience with me and your help and assistance and just for being a good class. Um, just know I appreciate it and I, I'll always remember it. I remember every class I've ever taught. So thank you for that. And I hope you have a good break, whether it's summer or winter break. Or if you end up taking this over the summer, have a good rest of your summer break.